Oh God, way to be a foodie killjoy. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. In today's video, we'll be taking a look at some very commonly demonized food additives lurking in your food. And I'm gonna break down the truth about whether or not you should be scared. But first, a very quick disclaimer that you can see on screen or in the description. And a reminder that if you are new here, hit that subscribe button, ring that bell, and follow me also over on TikTok and Instagram for more great myth-busting content. All right, AFO, it is time to put my food scientist hat on today and address all of those scary Instagram reels and TikToks that we've all seen come up in our feeds. You know, the ones put out there by the unregulated influencers with bogus professional titles like expert food coach telling you that if you eat ingredients that you don't recognize, your body doesn't recognize it either. <gasps> I mean, it's a cute little sound bite, but what the does that even mean? Well, according to said experts, all of those seemingly harmless ingredients lurking in every corner of your neighborhood grocery store are causing inflammation, bloating, gut disruption, cancer, leaky gut, headaches, fatigue, and literally every other disease. It sounds scary as and I personally understand this fear. I mean, this is precisely the type of fear-mongering pseudoscience language that drove me into an eating disorder as a young adult. But here at Abby's Kitchen, you know we are all about facts, not fear. So I think if you'd like, we're gonna start a new series here, Toxic with Abby Sharp. I mean, there are a lot of so-called poisonous ingredients, so we'll talk all day on these, but I'm gonna start with a few of the popular ones and break them down into actual science. No bull no fear, just pure science with a side of sass. All right, first things first, natural flavors. Now, according to the FDA, natural flavors derive their aroma and flavor from naturally occurring plant or animal sources, including fruit, meat, fish, spices, herbs, roots, leaves, buds, or bark. These ingredients are then distilled, fermented, and manipulated to yield the desirable flavor. Now, this is in contrast to artificial flavors, which derive their flavor profile from a synthetic chemical source. But it's important to note that regardless of the source, natural foods and artificial foods all come from chemicals. And most of the time, these chemical structures are indistinguishable from each other, regardless of whether they were derived from a man-made or a natural source. So this to me isn't a concern. If someone tells you otherwise, they don't understand food chemistry. Now the controversy around these substances is that natural flavors are allowed to have things like stabilizers or preservatives in them, AKA artificial ingredients, which can help to you know, improve their performance in food. The FDA also doesn't require companies to disclose all of the ingredients in a flavor blend. They can just say natural flavors. So while research suggests that natural flavors are safe to consume for the vast majority of people, if you have unique dietary restrictions or rare allergies, there may be a reason to avoid them. So obviously a vegan may want to avoid flavors derived from animals and folks with certain, like a fruit allergy or something, may want to avoid flavors derived from such fruit. The good news is, is that if any of the top eight food allergens were to be used as a natural ingredient, they must declare that on the packaging. So right now, sesame currently is not included in that legislation, but updated labeling regulations are definitely on the fast track to include sesame as the ninth allergen to be listed. And thankfully, some of the big companies like Hershey's and General Mills have kind of preemptively taken initiative to identify it on the label anyway. So should you be concerned about the natural flavors in the foods you eat? Well, when I spoke to Erin at Food Science Babe, who is an actual food scientist, she assured me that food flavors are actually some of the most well-regulated ingredients in food. 
The Flavor Extract Manufacturers Association panel, aka FEMA, compiles scientific data on different flavors that are generally recognized as safe or grass, and they share this information with the FDA as well as international scientific and regulatory bodies. Flavor companies don't necessarily have to disclose the application of flavor ingredients that have already passed this review, but anything new or novel would need to go through this rigorous testing procedure to demonstrate their safety safety before it can be used. Now, if you had a very specific food allergy that would not be listed under the top eight rule, then again, I totally understand the desire to avoid these types of foods. But for the general population, these natural flavors are considered safe and they can make nutritious foods more palatable and accessible for more people, which we love. And even if we were to be extra, extra skeptical and assume that, you know, down the road, we were to discover some kind of concerning element in these foods. Remember that the dose always makes the poison. So my personal and professional opinion is that if you're enjoying ultra processed foods in moderation and the words natural flavors aren't the first and therefore biggest ingredient on every ingredient list of every food that you eat, the amount consumed is almost certainly benign and safe for most folks. Again, assuming that they don't have an unlisted food allergy. Drink your damn La Croix or La Croix, La Croix, whatever they're called. But I, honestly, I say flavored water that you like is better than plain water that you don't like. Next, all right, we talked flavor. Let's talk about color. And what I mean by that is artificial food color or dye. So this one comes up a lot and it's actually one of the only food related products that I personally avoid for no other reason than if I consume a lot of it, it gives me hives. But that doesn't mean that it's universally toxic or bad. Now, the most common food dyes in the United States are red 40, yellow five, and yellow six. And when I asked Food Science Babe why some food dyes are banned in some countries and approved in others, she told me it really comes down to differences in regulations and interpretation of data. One country's laws aren't necessarily more protective than another because often a food may be approved in one country but banned in another and vice versa. Now, one of the big concerns around food dyes is their potential role in increasing hyperactivity or ADHD in children. Now, a 2004 analysis of 15 studies did find that artificial food dyes did slightly increase hyperactivity in children, but a lot of other research suggests that the effect is genetically determined and not all children react the same. In other words, this is largely inconclusive and anecdotally is often confounded by the fact that with artificially colored foods often comes novel fun experiences like birthday parties or holidays. Now, the next question is, what about the risk of cancer? Well, pretty much all of our research here is done on rats, which of course does not always apply to humans. And even still, the only dyes with any concerning data in this area are blue two and red three. Now, while most research found no adverse effects of blue two on rodents, one study found a statistically significant increase in brain tumors in rats given a high dose of blue two, though the researchers warned it wasn't clear if that was even the result of the dye. Red three on the other hand is definitely the most controversial food dye. We've got research on rats here showing an increase in thyroid tumors. So this resulted in actually a partial ban on the product, which was later reversed when it was concluded that the thyroid tumors were maybe not directly caused by the red three. Regardless, if you read enough food packages today, you'll find that with the exception of some super old school maraschino cherries, candies, and some random popsicles, red three has almost completely been replaced by red 40. So is food dye a huge concern? Well, like I said before, the dose makes the poison. And if maraschino cherries are making up a significant portion of you or your children's diet, then I would say we probably have bigger fish to fry. Next up, everyone's favorite frenemy, monosodium glutamate, AKA MSG. Now you probably know of MSG as the umami flavored food additive that's present in a lot of ultra processed foods and Chinese food takeout. 
but it's really just a sodium salt of an amino acid called glutamic acid. Despite being used for hundreds of years to enhance palatability thanks to its umami-like flavor, this ingredient received a bad reputation back in the 1960s thanks to a doctor who wrote a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine claiming that he got sick from Chinese food. Despite no clear association between his sickness and MSG consumption, this letter sparked a cascade of misinformation and poorly conducted studies on MSG, which fueled the fear around this very common food additive. However, one review of the literature found that the majority of the studies pointing to the harmful effects of MSG were highly, highly flawed and based on doses that would never be reasonably consumed by humans or present in food products. So once again, the dose makes the poison. Now it's also worth pointing out that a ton of whole foods naturally contain glutamate and this naturally occurring glutamate is indistinguishable to the body from the glutamate in added MSG. So vegetables like tomatoes, mushrooms, corn, broccoli, spinach, and green peas, as well as cheese and animal-based protein like chicken, beef, salmon, and shrimp all contribute to the approximate 13 grams of glutamate that adults eat each day. Even mother's breast milk, which is a food that wellness culture has long deemed the perfect food, is very high in glutamate. In other words, we have been consuming the stuff since we came out of the womb and likely every day since. Having said all of that, MSG sensitivity is a real thing, but the research suggests it only affects roughly 1% of the general population and that it takes on average about three grams of MSG to cause any of these transient symptoms. And the key here is the word transient. This does not cause permanent damage since MSG can't even cross the blood-brain barrier. Otherwise, double-blind placebo multiple challenge research suggests that the rest of the population don't actually experience any symptoms when they don't know they're consuming MSG. And since the average MSG enriched food contains only about 0.5 grams of MSG, I would say that this is a safe additive that can actually enhance the palatability of nutritious foods for the general population. And if you're experiencing excessive symptoms from takeout and ultra processed foods, again, I think it makes more sense to focus on maybe adding more fresh meals to your diet rather than making that one little additive the scapegoat to blame. Next, let's talk about high fructose corn syrup. So we know high fructose corn syrup is a common additive in a wide range of processed foods, but what makes it unique from, let's say, table sugar or honey? Well, chemically speaking, not much. While there are super high fructose versions that can contain up to 90% fructose, the most common variety used, high fructose corn syrup 55, has roughly the same fructose to glucose ratio as table sugar, aka sucrose, and it isn't far off of honey either. One of the only noticeable differences between sucrose and high fructose corn syrup 55 is that the syrup is 24% water, making it a liquid, while table sugar, as we know, is dry and granular. Chemically, the fructose and glucose in the corn syrup and the honey are not bound together as they are in something like sucrose, but they actually all get broken apart in the body anyway, so they end up ultimately looking the same. And as we established, high fructose corn syrup 55 has slightly higher fructose than sucrose and honey. But despite these very minor differences, research suggests that they all ultimately have the same metabolic effects in the body. So what's to blame for the bad rep? Well, back in the 1980s, high fructose corn syrup consumption increased as it began to be used more often in food production as a cheaper alternative to sucrose. At the same time, obesity rates in the US began to climb. Many were quick to point the finger at high fructose corn syrup as the culprit. However, as we know, correlation does not equal causation. And we don't have strong evidence to suggest that the high fructose corn syrup specifically is what caused the obesity epidemic. In fact, one study tested the effects of four calorically restricted diets containing different amounts of sucrose and high fructose corn syrup, and they found that 
all of the participants were able to lose weight, even when consuming the high fructose corn syrup. Other research has confirmed that when comparing equal parts of high fructose corn syrup to sucrose, there have been no differences observed in fullness, insulin response, leptin levels, or weight change. Sure, we could say that something like honey may have a slight nutritional advantage to both these other sweeteners because it contains small amounts of antioxidants, but you would need to consume a ton of honey to meet your antioxidant and micronutrient needs. And that, my friends, is just as problematic for your health as consuming an excess of high fructose corn syrup. And actually, if we want to play dirty here, folks, honey actually has more calories than table sugar per tablespoon. But anyways, most of us aren't putting high fructose corn syrup manually on like our oatmeal or on our berries the way we might use honey. We're ultimately getting it from ultra processed foods. So again, my tip here is to focus on moderating your consumption of ultra processed foods containing any kind of sweeteners rather than obsessing over which specific sweetener it contains. Let's not lose sight of the forest from the trees here, folks. It's the dietary pattern, not the sweetener that actually matters. And finally, let's round things off with hydrogenated oils. So hydrogenated oils are commonly used in food manufacturing to increase the shelf life of processed foods and enhance their flavor and texture. Now it's important to note that there are two types of hydrogenated oils, fully hydrogenated oils and partially hydrogenated oils. And while they're similarly used in food manufacturing, they actually result in two different types of fats. Unfortunately, most food label experts on Instagram don't seem to understand this. I see people call out hydrogenated oils as trans fats all the damn time, and this is factually incorrect. Fully hydrogenated oils are saturated fats. Partially hydrogenated oils are trans fats. And it's the trans fats that are pretty indisputably regarded as bad for your health. The good news is that trans fat consumption from processed foods is not something that you even need to actively worry about too much here in North America, since Canada and the United States at least have implemented a trans fat ban and eliminated the use of partially hydrogenated oils in food manufacturing. Hydrogenated saturated oils, on the other hand, don't necessarily carry the same risk to our health, which is why they're still used in food manufacturing to this day. Now, this is not to say that saturated fats should be consumed in excess, especially because the jury is still out on the relative health risk of saturated fats, which I actually discuss in a lot more detail in my video right here. But while it's unclear if sat fats are bad, good, or neutral, it does seem that replacing them with unsaturated fats is advantageous or better for our health. So where does that leave us with our consumption of these hydrogenated oils? Say it with me, folks. The dose makes the poison. Ugh, music to my ears. I really don't see a huge major health risk with enjoying a snack food with some hydrogenated oils in it in the context of an otherwise balanced day. So on that note, I hope that was a good reminder of the general safety of our food system and that our focus really should be on the overall dietary pattern, not on singling out specific nutrients in any one specific food. So if you like this video, be sure to give it the thumbs up. Leave me a comment below on what food additives you want to see me discuss next. Subscribe to the channel and I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.